North Korean nuclear crisis. In a meeting with his South Korean counterpart, Moon Jae-in, in Russia, made without political and diplomatic. Meanwhile, the U.S. has prepared a draft resolution calling on the United Nations Security Council to impose an oil embargo on North Korea. The resolution also wants a ban on the country's exports of textiles and the hiring of North Korean laborers abroad. It also demands the assets of leader Kim Jong-un be frozen. Elsewhere, the U.S. president has said military action against North Korea is not the first choice. President Xi would like to do something. We'll see whether or not he can do it. But we will not be putting up with what's happening at North Korea. I believe that President Xi agrees with me 100 percent. He doesn't want to see what's happening there either. Uh, we had um, a very, very frank and very strong phone call. We're going to see what happens. We'll see what happens. Certainly, that's not a first choice, but we will see what happens. Trump had earlier said that now is the time to talk to North Korea and that all options remain open. He warned of fire and fury if Pyongyang continued with its missile tests. So far, those threats have gone unheeded in Pyongyang, which has recently launched several missiles. Last week, North Korea said it successfully test-fired a hydrogen bomb, drawing international condemnation. The U.S. and its allies have repeatedly urged the North to give up its nuclear and missile programs. However, Pyongyang says they are essential to counter U.S. threats and aggression. To discuss that further, we're not joined by Jason Ruve, who is a political commentator, and he is joining us live now by Skype from Ontario. Jason, thanks for joining us. Um, what do you make, Jason, uh, of the fact that it seems, at least, that Kim Jong-un really has checkmated almost um, U.S. President Trump in the sense that Trump just a while back was saying, we're going to use fire and fury to, to fight North Korea. Now he says, oh, no, wait, we can possibly use dialogue. Uh, I think it's very typical of President Trump to do such a thing. Uh, he often spews rhetoric about what it is that he wants to do or perhaps how he feels at the time. And then later he has to pull back and issue some other kind of uh, situation or some other kind of response because his advisors have probably pulled him aside and told him that, that they're not capable of doing what he says. Uh, Trump does seem to have a, a propensity towards bombast. And that's not how a professional politician should act. I mean, there definitely is a complete roadblock here as to what the United States can do against the DPRK. The military option is off the table. There is no way of actually attacking the DPRK without the cost of the war being greater than any benefits that would arise from toppling the DPRK government. And these new sanctions are, are, are just that. Uh, they're saber rattling that the DPRK is uh, may or may not take particularly seriously. Any sanctions against any alleged wealth that Kim Jong Un himself holds won't really do anything to the country. If anything, it only tend to uh, irk the man himself. But but perhaps that's what the United States is going for. However, blockading oil against the country is is a very serious business. Uh, the uh, uh, energy resources alone are a tremendous, uh, tremendous part of anyone's economy and completely inseparable from every sector of that economy. Now, a simple rise in gas price could do a tr could cause a tremendous amount of inflation. As we saw with the, the United States of the gas shortage in the 1970s, put on a larger scale, it could be far more destructive. So Jason, you know, in, in many ways, hasn't Kim Jong-un really, by his actions, proven that uh, exactly what he says, really, that the North needs this deterrent, um, the strong deterrent to be able to keep itself safe? Doesn't this entire situation really continue to prove that point? Oh, absolutely. The DPRK has uh, followed the policy of Songgon, which means military first. Uh, they place all of their resources into defending themselves from imperialist conquest. And that has definitely won out. Uh, there's uh, many heavy criticisms have been leveled against the country for having such a policy. But in the end, the policy has proven to be successful. The DPRK has not been invaded by the United States and for the foreseeable future seems to be immune from any physical acts on a large scale, at least from U.S. imperialism. All that's left now is tough words against the DPRK. The ultimatum has already been made. 
if you further continue, there's going to be repercussions to your actions on a military scale. Uh, the DPRK has continued completely unabated by the threats made by Donald Trump. And as a result, we see that Trump's words were hollow. There has been no military conflict forthcoming. The DPRK has made the right choice in placing its uh, a, a military insistence of its independence ahead of everything else. All right, Jason, we'll leave it there at that. But if I can say anything Michael Hilton has to say, the, the uh, intelligence community under George Bush and under Barack Obama is uh, almost entirely engaged in a coup attempt against President Trump, a color revolution, uh, in order to prevent uh, Trump's commitment to reestablishing friendly relations with Russia and China. Uh, now, there's no question that Trump threw from the hip when he talked about uh, dangers, including, of course, what he had to say about, about the North Korea situation. But he also, uh, he and his Secretary of State, Tillerson, have uh, committed to South Korea that there will be no military action in North Korea without the full compliance of South Korea. Uh, the problem we're looking at here, as Linda LaRue identified yesterday, is that the intentional sabotage uh, by people like Michael uh, and others in the Bush and Obama administration uh, to sabotage the agreements that were made in 1994, uh, the so-called Agreed Framework, which was a peace through development solution that not only secured North Korea's security, uh, but uh, also uh, engaged in a, a economic buildup of the North Korean economy, which also facilitated Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy uh, to reestablish connections between North and South Korea. Economically, that was sabotaged when Bush and Cheney came in uh, to outright cancel a working agreement uh, in order to maintain a conflict with North Korea. The Bush and Obama administration did not want stop North Korea from building a nuclear weapon because this justified their massive military buildup around China. This is, has very, very little to do with North Korea and the very unusual regime they have there, although everybody knows, as Mr. Putin said today, that the North Koreans know full well what happened to Libya and what happened to Iraq when they gave up their weapons of mass destruction. They were bombed back to the Stone Age and their leaders were massacred. Uh, and there's no way in hell that North Korea will stop its nuclear program and its missile program unless its security is guaranteed, which Mr. Tillerson has assured them. There will be no regime change. There will be no invasion, he says. But they are not going to believe that unless Mr. Trump carries out his commitment to working closely with Russia and China, not provocations of Russia and China, as are now being carried out by people even within his own administration, people he compromised with yeah, when he came into the presidency because he did not have a broad political base. He had to make compromises with Wall Street, with the intelligence community, and these people are now pushing for a war with Russia and with China. North Korea is their convenient excuse for building up a massive military position against China to stop President Trump from joining with the New Silk Road, joining with Russia in the war on terror, uh, and in, in their view, to bring America back into the fold of the British Empire in a confrontation with Russia and China. The um, alliance between the United States, Russia, and China would break the power of the British Empire, meaning the financial institutions of London and Wall Street, which are in this in a current state of, of, of bankruptcy ready to collapse and are committed to war and looting of the developing sector as a policy to preserve their bankrupt power. Uh, we in, in, in the LaRouche movement are committed to defending President Trump uh, on his commitment to forming a friendship with Russia and China to get him to go full steam ahead by joining the Silk Road and that Silk Road is also the only solution to the North Korean problem. Getting back to cooperation, pledging security to North Korea in exchange for economic development with Russia and China and South Korea working together in North Korea 
to establish the Silk Road from Busan to Rotterdam. This is the only solution. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation, but it's also pregnant with the potential of breaking the back of the British imperial crowd, including in Wall Street, including in Washington, uh, who are committed to confrontation to a geopolitical war policy against Russia and China. And that is the only solution to the Korea situation.